By the way, it wasn't on my script, but two WWE Hall of Famers as well here in the room. All right, who wants to go first? The, the office knows that you don't care and that your shoulders hit, lay on the canvas. It takes 99% of the power away from them. If you, you know, you beat him every night, you don't care. Yeah. So leave, get, me, leave me laying yeah. and they're still chant ready. As soon as we got so guaranteed no money, we just like, you know, they that, that either one of us would have worried about is when there was a winner's prize. <laughs> you, know, you get at 20... Sorry, I'm not, re I'm not good with round things in front of my face. <laughs> it's not my forte. <laughs> Imagine putting it in some, somebody else's face. Just don't hold the tip. <laughs> Seems like I smell that so far. <laughs> it's this part, you cock blocking the sound. <laughs> Dave, you got some for you. Sweet ass yeah, shirt, bro. Switch, thank switch, you, thank switch you. mics with me, man. I think I've got a faulty mic. Before you guys got to WWE, were you guys as tight back before then um, as you guys became? No, we fell in love the first night. The first, the first night we put an NWO shirt. I remember. Real quick, real quick, and then if not, when did you guys and the rest of the clique really become just like tight like brothers? Well, I remember. Meeting Kev in the WCW days, you know, he was Oz, I was a Diamond Dud, and Kev lived in Atlanta at that time, and I lived here in Orlando. So we flew up, and, and we agreed to make, like, a trip together. <laughs> I don't know, it just, Kev is so big that even, he had a caddy back then, and even then, Kev is so big, like, he's just uncomfortable in a caddy. His knees are all jacked up, it's hot, you know, we're, we're all young and muscled up, we got tank tops and shorts on. And so we're riding along. We don't really know each other. <laughs> I don't know why I did this, but I did it. So I reached out. I was a little bit pissed off for a while, but he got over it. I mean, I, I could understand where Sean was coming from because he finally got to be the man. And you can't be the man without a supporting cast underneath you. And Kevin and I were leaving, and no one ever left Vince on top before. So it was, everything was all shook up, you know. But the way I looked at it was, like, the clique we divided and conquered. Like you guys you think in the ring. If you watched a lot of matches, especially back in the 90s there with Sean, he'll be laying there and he'll be barking orders to everybody. He'll be telling me what to do, he'll be telling the referee what to do. That he said, tell that big in effort not to not to move till I say so. <laughs> because then we just went into a longer. We went into the instead of moving on eight, we moved on like 30. <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys about DX and you know they came out a little bit after y'all if I remember correctly. What did y'all think of that angle and you know I know it was all click buddies and everything but it seems like they tried to like compete with y'all and I always thought NWO was the better you know stable and are you disappointed you never got to do the uh the versus thing while they were, we were both in your crimes, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, to me, it was like the, when, they, when they brought us back, you know, to WWE when, uh, it was actually still the WWF when we got there, but when, uh, they, when they bought Turner, uh, <laughs> you're right a lot of times, Vince, you weren't right that time. <laughs> it's kind of like Ben Affleck as Batman. But, uh, <laughs> I'll go with Adam West. Anyway, uh, they just, the first thing was, we were both off, and we, we were both living in Florida, and my pager went off like four or five different times, and it was a 404 number, and at the end of it, it said 911. So I was just like, jeez, man. So I knew 404 was Atlanta, so I, finally I stopped. There was a, uh, I was in a bad part of town, I stopped at a pawn shop, used the, the payphone outside, and they said, Scott's in the air, they're on the way to pick you up, go to the private airport, and we're gonna, we, have, we have a meeting in Atlanta at this Jock and Jill Sports Club, which was an actual sports bar that was connected to the CNN Center. Something like, 
like, what did we do? Like, oh no, we're in yeah, trouble already? I'm thinking like, I don't remember murdering anybody or, you know, so, you know the plane lands and Scott's on there and, you know, they were nice enough to have some cold beer, so we least had something to do on the way to, to Atlanta. We got there, we sat in this corner thing, and the next thing you know, they're putting contracts in front of us. And they're giving us raises. And they're extending the time that we're going to be there, like another year. So we're getting more money and uh, more time. More money, more problems. So we're like, all right. So we, you know, and we left. Flew back. And so then it's two weeks, it's two weeks away now from the diesel and razor on Raw. And now it's one week away, and, and now it's the night of. And in the back of the production truck was a screen, I don't know how, maybe a 30-inch screen on the back of the truck. And we're standing looking at the TV screen. Here's Nick Lambros, who's the, the legal guy. Eric's next to him and then some other stooge. And they're staring at us as they go to commercial thinking that all of a sudden there's going to be like this cloud of, of smoke and poof, like we're not going to be there. Next thing you know, it comes up, they, 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 they play the music, they do the, the razor start, they do the, deep, the, the diesel gimmick, they both walk out, it's clearly not us. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. bash at the beach, up the road in Daytona, when the NWO was born. Woo! Yeah, don't be afraid. Yeah, you know. It was so cool for me and Ken to like look at each other and like here and steer Hulk. Here's the hard camera, buddy. Over this way. You know, but I mean, I just wanted to go like get a shot of that so I can put it in my little Mark scrapbook in my mind. Like, oh, uh, did business. This is, this is how over Hulk Hogan is. I'm looking at all these cutouts. This is actually a cutout of a Hogan doll. <laughs> it's not even a Hulk, it's a doll. He has a cutout of his doll. What the hell is that? And they, they, I'm just looking at it like, don't these deltoids look out like that unless they're a doll? Some fine, some fine WCW early work right there. That's what we walked into. Yeah, it was really, it really kind of sucked because we, when we came in, NWO blew up. But WCW had never had any kind of demand for merchandise, so they couldn't keep up with it. We'd be on the road, like on a 10-day run, and and we'd be walking down the building, people, hey, oh, give me your shirt. And I'd be wearing an NWO shirt, and I'd go, no, go buy one. they go, there aren't any. They would sell out after two days. It was crazy. By the time they got up to speed with the marketing was when guys like, Bill Goldberg scored because finally they could meet the demand. There were so many people who didn't get into real shirts that wanted them. Crazy. But you can buy them now at WWEshop.com because we still get a cut. This is more just a comment that uh, I always go back and watch that. Uh, I know you guys have said you didn't like really doing it when you look back on it, but that. Old Horseman uh, parody that you guys did where Nash was coming out as double A, and it was just it's hilarious. I go back and watch it all the time. Oh, we like that. We just they just didn't like work with us. <laughs> yeah, and you know what sucked for me is I I was wrestling in some early match. I didn't get to be a part of it. It's history making comedy. They're just they're not booing. They're just waiting for the the punch lines. And they're laughing, and it was funny, and. We got in the back and there was no heat with any of the guys from the horsemen. And then, you know, systematically. Wait, didn't you have a cooler? Yeah, I had a cooler when I came down. But systematically. Where, where, where did your cooler come from? Oh, we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> systematically, each one of the horsemen calls home. I didn't mean you guys look like assholes. And they all came down. And so next thing you know, I'm, I'm walking in the building and Arms walks up to me and he's got. Three course lights in one hand and two in the other. I just tore my knee up playing basketball. I need to find something else to do because I sure as hell don't want to 
still that way. Um, I felt the same way. Like uh, my first big time angle in the WWE was working against Randy, and this is when they were really pushing Razor hard. And Randy wasn't used to doing jobs at that point in his career. Randy didn't do jobs, but he was losing every night to Razor. And, uh, and I'm just totally marked out. I'll never forget the first time we did an interview together. Like, you know, in contact by then, did you see what we did all day? And uh, we're, the click is running the rest of the world. It's the way it felt to me. I think it's great. Like I said, we were at that thing in Chicago, and to see these young dudes going out there and doing it on their own, I think it's great. What's up, guys? Nash and all. Love you guys since uh, early 92 and 93. Uh, quick question. Since you guys are tag team, was there another tag team that you guys seen on your level when you guys were coming up as the outsiders? And I have a second question. It's more for nostalgia. How did it feel to work with the incredible Hulk Hogan and also with a bunch of my men? There were a lot. I mean, there, there were some great tag teams in that era. Uh, we always had we did really good chemistry with Harlem B. We had good chemistry with the Steiners. Long story short, we're uh, we got a we have a tag match in Booster, and Scott's supposed to come in and break it up by using the belt. And Scott just what, worst thing you can do on Earth is give Scott Hall a belt to hit you with. I guess not. <laughs> um, it was like they kept coming because every week, like it was Bischoff going, oh, we need new guys, we need new guys. And so anybody who had ever had any kind of TV presence for WWE got a job. I mean, Virgil became Vincent. Now, do you guys know the story behind that? Yeah. I mean, Dusty Rhodes' name is Virgil Ramos. So when they brought Virgil in, Vince was, and that's when back when there was still two major companies competing. You know, Crockett Promotions was still drawing big money against WWE. So they brought Vir Virgin in and, and kind of kind of a little dig at Dusty. So then years later when they brought him back, it was Bischoff sticking it back like we're going to call him Vincent. You know, but it was just anybody who had any kind of recognition. We knew it was watered down from the get-go, but you got to understand, when you've been whoring yourself out for Vince, basically you only get what you made that night. You know, you're on the road. In, to me, if you're a wrestler, you're kind of like a prostitute. You're making money with your body. So when you work for Vince, you're like a streetwalker. Like, like, what did you do? Like, I'm on this corner and this is what I did. When you work for Turner, you're like a high dollar escort. You know, you get any money, you're not doing as much, but you're still kind of in the same walk of life and you at least get dinner. <laughs> and a nice hotel. But it was just, it was brutal, but at the same time, after grinding out like we did, and having popped it, like, everything we did worked. Like, you could imagine, every building we went to was sold out. You gotta understand, all these people at WCW had never dealt with that before. Vince was used to huge success. He had always had huge success. They had never experienced that in Atlanta, and we came, two of us would beat Austin, and then, Rock would go over on Hogan, but Scott and I would hit the ring, and we'd leave the Rock at the end of the night in, in a pool of blood, and they'd never...